Good morning, everyone. God bless you this morning. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your presence here with us already today. Thank you for these songs of your kingdom. Thank you for your spirit who is here with us and for your word that you've given to us. Open our ears now. Open our eyes. Open our minds. Help us to receive your truth today. Be glorified. Holy Spirit, come. We welcome you to this place in Jesus' name. Amen. Many of you have been following the events in Boston and in Texas this week, and some of you have no doubt been praying for the victims of the tragedy. Thank you for that, and, and they will need prayers in future days as well. The challenge is there will be new things to pray for this week and in the week to come, but thank you for praying for them. One of the things I'm aware of when tragedy happens is this groundwell of support and coming together in communities. Isn't it a beautiful thing? I'm just convinced that there is an immense reservoir of goodwill left in the world. And it's a, it's a beautiful thing to see. Um, turn me up a little bit. I'm, my voice is a little bit worn. I sang, sang too much earlier. And I'll, I, won't, I won't blast you out, but that's great. Thank you. I saw this post on Facebook, and maybe some of you did as well this week, from Fred Rogers. Mr. Rogers, as we know him. He says, when I was a boy and I would see scary things in the news, my mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. I thank God that so many of you are helpers and want to be helpers. That's one of the things I think of when I think of Brook Hill. And this was true of Tabitha, the woman that Katie read of from Acts chapter 9. A godly woman, a doer of good deeds, a helper of the poor. Then she became sick and died. And her friends sent for the apostle Peter ten miles away in Lydda. Okay, we're feeding back just a hair. I think I need to be cut back. But that was great while it lasted. (laughs) So they said, come quickly. Now I want you to think for me, with me for a moment, about the faith of these friends of Tabitha. Here their friend is dead. Dead. But they're thinking, okay, Peter is only 10 miles away. We'll see if we can get him to come here, and maybe God will raise our friend from the dead. Doesn't that strike you as an amazing faith? We just we read these things and we gloss over them, and it's kind of like we have scales over our eyes. But I, I just am flabbergasted by the faith. I've never thought that with a dead friend. Okay, let's find somebody and see if we can if God will resurrect this person from the dead. I want to hang out with people like that. Don't you? That's an amazing thing. And uh, so they went and got Peter. Peter arrived on the scene. Widows were weeping all around. In all three services, the scripture reader used the word windows rather than widows and corrected themselves. (laughs) It must be an easy mistake to make. Um, So the widows were there. Peter asked them to leave. He prayed and then spoke to her. Tabitha, get up. Don't know how long he prayed before he spoke to the corpse. She opened her eyes, sat up. Peter helped her to her feet and presented her alive. Can you imagine the scene when the door opened? Out comes Peter with Tabitha holding his hand. What a miracle. 
It's the only known time that Peter raised a person from the dead. Let me tell you, once would be enough, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that be good on your resume? I prayed for this person, and they they were resurrected from the dead. Once would be enough, wouldn't it? Peter had been with Jesus several years before, with Jesus when he had raised a young girl from the dead in a very similar way. And we read about that both in Mark and in Luke. Peter must have been pretty observant of Jesus' method because it's the method he used as well. Let's begin by saying that Jesus Christ is at the heart of the healing process. He is at the heart of wholeness. He said, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He said that the prophecy of Isaiah was fulfilled in him. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will be set free, that the oppressed will be delivered, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. Friend, if you are in need of healing, you need to know Jesus as the center of your life. He needs to be come. And he needs to be your savior, your leader. If you're in need of physical healing, we need to welcome Jesus to mend the other places of our lives that are broken. We all have other places that are broken aside from any physical need that we have. Can you believe a pastor would stand before you and say that even as I'm preaching that there are broken places in my life? We have needs, and we need to be open and seeking and willing to receive everything that Christ has for us. Let's continue by saying that healing is real, and resurrection from the dead is real, though pretty rare. There is a bomb in Gilead, as the choir sang just a few minutes ago. There is divine medicine for our ailing bodies and broken spirits. Now, first of all, we know this is true because we were created so that we recover from many illnesses without needing medicine or medical care. We call it nature at work, but we have the flu, and very often we take something for the headache or whatever, but our body fights off the flu, and this is the natural process, the way that God has created us. But beyond that, secondly, The Bible emphasizes healing both in the Old Testament and the New. God told the Israelites in the Hebrew Bible, I am the God who heals you. And in the Old Testament, we have some miracles, several barren women who were healed and enabled to bear children, several persons who were cleansed from leprosy, uh, several occasions where God delivered the whole nation of Israel from plagues. And both Elijah and Elisha prayed for children who were raised from the dead. But then when we come to the New Testament, when we come to the life of Jesus, we see an explosion of physical healings. I don't know how to call it other than that. It's a tremendous increase, an exponential increase of these supernatural acts. In the New Testament, 70 or 41 situations are mentioned where Jesus healed people. Those afflicted by demons were set free. Lepers were cleansed. People with crippling infirmities were healed. Blind men were made to see. Three persons were raised from the dead. In fact, one-fifth of all of the verses in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, one-fifth, are taken up with Jesus involved in healing someone or raising someone from the dead. This is not a minor part of his ministry. This was a sign of his divinity. And John even says every time that there is a miracle in John's gospel, John calls it a sign. It's a signpost. It's pointing to the fact that Jesus is not just a great teacher, but that he is God himself. 
And then, even beyond the New Testament, we move into the years of church history down to the present day. And we have eyewitness accounts of healings and even resurrections, though, as I said, resurrections are not too common. My Nigerian friend, Chib Buba Egbu, told me one time of a funeral that he was at where a group of people felt compelled to pray for the person who had died, and that person was raised from the dead or resuscitated. And in a book entitled Like a Mighty Wind, an Indonesian evangelist, Mel Tari, speaks of a resurrection of a man in the village of Amphuang in Indonesia, a man who had been dead for two days, long enough that you could smell the body decomposing, and you should be glad that I didn't quote from the book because it's far grosser than that. The resurrected, the man was resurrected. A group of people felt compelled to pray and to sing, and about the seventh or eighth song, this gentleman's toes began to move. He was resurrected. He spoke freely to many people about what had happened, and 20,000 people in the area believed in Jesus, at least partly through his testimony. This was in the 1970s. Okay, so some of you are still skeptical. Whether we believe those reports or not, we must wrestle with the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, if Christ has not been raised then all our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. If our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. United Methodists, more than anybody I've ever met, call themselves Easter people. And whatever we mean by that, whatever else we mean, it must mean that we believe that Jesus Christ physically died. He really died. He was put into the tomb, and he was raised to physical life by the power of God. Not a myth. Reality. Don't we believe that? Why even be here if we don't believe that? It's been two months now since our friend Roger Delaney left this earthly existence. I did not want him to go. For 12 days before he died, I was fasting from meat and desserts, asking God to heal him. Over the course of those months, a number of us on a number of occasions laid hands on Roger and prayed for him. And during those 12 days that I was doing that partial fast, 15 pages in my journal are filled with prayers for Roger. I thought he was healthier than he was. I thought he was still in the midst of a battle. If I I thought he was near the end, I would not have had faith for that kind of a fast. I believed that God would heal him. I came to believe in those 12 days that God would heal him and spare his life. But I was wrong. I still believe in divine healing. I've seen it. I still pray for people to be healed. But there are just things we do not understand about healing. I have a theory, but you don't want to hear my theory today. That would be a whole other sermon, and you come to me, and we'll talk about that. In the meantime, I'm going to keep on praying for God to heal people, and sometimes they will be healed. I think they're more likely to be healed if I pray for them than if I don't. I believe that there are some of you that God wants you as well to be praying for people's healing. Don't give up because we don't understand how this works. We've seen enough to believe in the reality of it, to know the reality of it. So let's go on beyond healing now, and let's affirm that in our lifetime, God has used other people to heal us and to help us. 
God used Peter, another person, to raise Tabitha from the dead. God uses people to heal, to help, to bless. We are not islands. Let's say it. We are not not islands. We're not an island. I could sing the song, and in the other services at least, nobody knew that was too old a song for anybody to know. We are not islands. We have been blessed and healed and helped by the love and grace of others. You were probably raised by parents who did the best they could to rear you and raise you and teach you and encourage you, and they might have used a little physical persuasion from time to time. You've probably been ministered to by doctors and medical professionals over the years. You've received cards and letters from friends that have been an encouragement to you. Maybe like me, you've been a dollar short at some time, and a nearby person has made up the difference so you could get that ice cream cone or T-shirt. I still owe Bob Schlody $5 from a year and a half ago when he bought a T-shirt for me. I hope that you are either married or related to those who love you deeply and who have sacrificed generously of their time and their attention and their affection, and they've made up the difference when you were a court low. And if we have any spiritual sense about us, we realize that all of these things are gifts from God, don't we? God uses other people to bless us, to help us. He's using other people to enrich us and to heal us and to make our lives better. Life is a communal event. And let me, and hear me today, you're in a bad way if you're not open to receiving the love and generosity of others. It may be that this is a word in particular for someone today. You just need to stop sometimes and let somebody do something for you. You need to receive God's grace from other people. Don't be proud. Just Shut up and let it happen. So let's take it one step further. God wants to use us to heal and help others. And we're going to say this a couple of times. Say it. God wants to use me. Say it. God God wants to to heal and help others. Let's say it together. God wants to use me to heal and help others. Here at Brook Hill, we believe that God wants to use us in this way. That's why the endowment committee wanted to give away $27,000 this year to worthy causes beyond the four walls of this church. That's why a Brook Hill work team went to Crisfield, Maryland, earlier this month to work on the home that was damaged by the flood a home of an African-American couple, Melvin Young, age 85, and Marguerite Young, 79. They had a foot of water in their home after Superstorm Sandy. And they had to wait six months for us to get there. And over the course of time, a number of folk have been working on their home and continue to do that. We believe that God wants to use us to heal and help others. That's why the women of Brook Hill's Team Nicaragua wept and prayed for a number of women last year, last June in Nicaragua. Among them was Maria, who had breast cancer and now has a a new baby. Among them also was a young woman who suffered continuous bleeding, perhaps similar to the woman who touched the hem of Jesus' garment in Matthew and Mark chapter 5, rather. They prayed for this lady, and within two days the bleeding had stopped. And in the months since, we've been helping her to get ongoing, high-quality, good medical care. We believe that God wants to use us to heal and help others. God wants to use you to heal and help others. That's why 20 of us, or more actually, I see 27 signed up now, We'll be in Knoxville, Maryland next Saturday with Rebuilding Together, working to upgrade the home of an elderly woman. That's why I might be wearing a kilt next month. (laughs) Tomfoolery, foolishness. But there are things that you can do that are peculiar to your gifts and passions and experience, either through Brook Hill or on your own 
to bless and help other people. I can't name, even in one year, all of the outreach efforts by Brook Hill volunteers, but we could mention Appalachian Service Project, we could mention the Frederick Food Bank and the Soup Kitchen. I try to keep track of them, and I can't, because I don't even know all of the places that you guys help out. We believe that God wants to use us to heal and help others. That's why for the past four years, we've sent mission teams to Guatemala to work at Mi Refugio School. And there in the mountains of Guatemala, poor students receive an education and two nutritious meals each day. Every day they hear about the love of Jesus and they see God's love at work every day. And Carrie is coming to share about her experience there just earlier this year and then Nan as well. 